against this myth that um, Omicron and, and all of these new variants are inherently mild and that the virus is going to continue uh, evolving towards uh, more mild forms uh, and then talk a little bit about what to expect uh, coming up. So uh, I think important to keep the, the last six months and really a longer uh, framed in the context of, of new variants, because these, even more than kind of the typical time cycle that uh, we've come to be familiar with uh, regarding SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, kind of rising in the fall and winter and receding a bit in the uh, spring and summer, uh, it's really the, the rise of these variants that has driven events uh, over the last eight to nine months. And, and this is a graphic for the US showing variant prevalence uh, over the last six months or so, really since the beginning of the year. And, and uh, even looking back, important to note that everything in that gray area is kind of uh, Delta and <clears throat> Omicron uh, and all of the previous variants. And this is really just documenting the rise of BA2 which as you can see, replaced Omicron. Those are kind of those blue shades uh, that replaced Omicron very quickly in the beginning of uh, this year by March becoming the dominant uh, form. And then BA4 and 5, as you can see over to the right, which have now been uh, the, the rising variants uh, since about uh, two months ago, um, May timeframe. Um, but already those potentially are starting to recede as, as new variants follow up. So I think the, you know, the history here is uh, where we were seeing variant replacement every six months or so um, from the rise of alpha to the rise of delta to the rise of Omicron. Now that pace is becoming faster and faster. Uh, over the last four months, uh, this has really happened twice, right? BA2 uh, and now BA4, 5 almost uh, you know, occurring on a 60-day cycle. So we'll see if this increased rate continues, but again, it's these new variants that are driving events uh, really even more than timing. Uh, so sorry, there is the rise of BA2 taking over from BA1 Omicron, and there's the rise of BA4 and 5 there. So um, how this is uh, reflected in uh, case counts in the US, you can see that red arrow is the peak of Omicron cases, and again, just once more remarkable to put that in the context of the other epidemic waves, which we thought at the time were huge, um, none compared to the case volume that uh, Omicron presented. And, and that, I think, highlights, again, that lesson that we talked about uh, quite a while ago when Omicron was first popping up, and it appeared that it was much more transmissible, although potentially uh, less likely to uh, put individuals in the hospital. You make up with volume what you lose in lethality, and you always want a more lethal versus a more transmissible virus. Uh, and unfortunately, that lesson played itself out as the epidemiology textbooks would tell you. Uh, and what we're seeing now in case counts, as you can see where the black arrow is, is this plateau that we've been riding for the last uh, two months or so that is really a dramatic under reflection of what the true case count is uh, given home testing and everything else that we've talked about before. So we're, we're at case levels now uh, on a daily basis in the US that far exceed what we saw with Delta and potentially are even rivaling what we saw in the previous fall wave uh, in 2020, 2021, uh, fall and winter, uh, just you know, dwarfed by that previous experience of Omicron that really reset our understanding of what a large community outbreak looks like. But here's where we're going back to that lesson of you always want a, a more lethal versus more transmissible virus. Uh, when you now look at the full mortality effect of Omicron, you can see that it is um, you know, the second largest uh, mortality uh, from any COVID epidemic wave uh, that we saw during the pandemic. Uh, and it's really not even very close between Delta or between uh, the initial 2020 wave. Only the wave of the, the fall and winter of 20 and 21 uh, outpace it. And the reason for that is obvious is because at that point, we still were not able to vaccinate the most vulnerable 
uh, of our population until uh, just after that wave had peaked. So uh, if we had seen similar mortality rates based on uh, no vaccine, uh, then Omicron would have actually been even much worse than that wave. So uh, again, Omicron, uh, by all counts, case counts, death toll, uh, was not at all mild, was actually quite severe. Um, and we saw that in hospitalizations. And, and what we're seeing now is BA4 and 5 causing a significant increase in hospitalizations again compared to that nadir of where we were as a country uh, back in April and May. We can see all states are really trending up. Uh, the average is quite uh, dramatically elevated. Uh, and again, if this is the set point going into the fall wave, uh, that puts us in a very bad situation. We're higher than we've been at any previous summer low point uh, in the pandemic. And don't forget, it's not only deaths and hospitalizations that are impactful in terms of the number of cases we're seeing on a daily basis, but as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, uh, it appears that these reinfections uh, and subsequent infections don't necessarily uh, carry a lower risk of uh, of long-term impact, as we saw from the VA study, rates of uh, post-COVID syndromes and post-COVID health effects of the cardiovascular system, uh, diabetes, uh, GI disease, kidney disease, all of these seem to be increased uh, with subsequent infections, not decreased, uh, as you can see there. So this is what we're seeing in terms of age trends now in hospitalizations across the country. Uh, and I think it's... Uh, you know, important to note that the increase in hospitalizations is still mostly being driven by folks over the age of 70. And I think now this is reflecting the fact that many of those folks, while they had been uh, vaccinated with two doses, um, a significant proportion of those folks have not received a booster and a pretty large proportion of them have not received a second booster or a fourth dose. And that is now contributing to, to much higher rates of hospitalizations. We, we are seeing that anecdotally in our hospital, uh, people who had received a, an initial series of two doses, but no vaccine since, and they are now uh, at significant risk for severe disease. But I think also important to note that the rates for all age groups are trending up. Uh, and that's true in Nebraska as well. And it's true for, again, all ages, including uh, pediatrics. Um, so when we look at our experience for th versus others, uh, I, I think this is another lesson to draw on, uh, kind of looking at the Omicron experience and what's happened uh, since then, really since the beginning of, uh, of January of this year. <laughs> I, I think, again, a lot of people and a, a lot of experts uh, had relied on this idea of an immune wall of protection, right? Kind of like this Maginot line uh, where uh, eventually everybody becoming infected or everybody getting vaccinated or both was going to create this uh, semi-impenetrable wall that would prevent uh, significant morbidity and mortality from COVID going forward. That was again, the basis of the you know, unfortunate and uh, misguided idea of the Great Barrington Declaration of just letting infection rip uh, trying to protect the most vulnerable. And, and we've had several uh, sessions where we've discussed the, the folly of that, um, uh, uh, of that idea. But again, I, I think the data really bear this out. When you look at how we have experienced the last six months since January compared to other countries that did a much better job of limiting infections prior to Omicron. And th this is why I think it's important to, to do that comparison with other countries. You know, the UK, I think, is one country that didn't do such a great job, certainly after uh, the early part of 2021 kind of went into a, a letter rip strategy similar to what we've done and allowed infections to go relatively unchecked. Um, but these other countries, New Zealand, Singapore, Australia, Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Japan, Canada, all did pretty good uh, jobs at reducing and limiting infections prior to the advent of Omicron. And you can see that from these confirmed uh, case count curves. And this is again, normalized per population. So it allows you to do an apples to apples comparison. So up until Omicron, you can see those countries had very low rates of infection compared to ours. But then after Omicron and with BA2 and BA4 and 5, they've had you know pretty whopping uh, infections because uh, 
they uh, also relaxed most of their non-pharmaceutical interventions and tried to rely on vaccine. But I think the point is that those who would have argued that, you know, that great Barrington argument that, well, since we had so many people infected, we, we should have been protected against the impacts compared to these other countries. And the data just don't bear that out, right? If you look at our overall uh, COVID mortalities per capita statistics, we're still way ahead of all of these other countries, even way ahead of the UK, who again adopted a, a mostly letter rip strategy, but did a much better job of boosting uh, the most vulnerable and adults. And so uh, we are still well beyond where these other countries are in terms of uh, per capita mortality. Now you can say we had such a head start going into Omicron that maybe that's just the effect there, uh, but we'll look and see where that's not the case. And, and again, to reemphasize, we had infected most people in the country by the time Omicron came about. This was a, a report that came out in MMWR. We talked about this a couple of months ago showing in February uh, zero prevalence uh, of anti-IgN antibody. That's only possible if you were infected, right? You, if you're vaccinated, you only make antibodies against spike protein because that's what's in the vaccines. If you're infected, you can make antibodies against the N protein on the surface or, uh, uh, that's included in the virus. And so this shows people who had been previously infected. And you can see in kids, it was already almost 50% by December, really, bef you know, before Omicron ever started. Uh, and increased to over 75% uh, by February, the end of the initial BA1 wave. Uh, and almost 60% of the population had antibodies by that time. So somewhere between Delta and Omicron uh, developed those antibodies. But when you look at the kinetics of anti-N antibodies, you actually see that this is a dramatic underestimate of the number of people who had truly been infected. There are several studies that have showed the kinetics of this, these antibodies, and they're all relatively similar. This paper out of Nature Communications is probably the best. Uh, it's a study from Chile of healthcare workers, so a relatively young population, a mean age of 42 years old. And you can see that in these 76 people that they followed after infection, a significant proportion of them down there didn't even develop anti-N antibodies to begin with. They were uh, zero fast. They never zero converted for anti-IGN. So you already are underestimating by about uh, you know a, a factor of one six the number of people who truly were infected. And then if you look at, at those antibodies over time, after about 180 days or six months, half of the population has actually dropped back below the level of positivity. And so now those folks are counted as IgN or IgG anti-N negative, even though they were previously infected. So the result is after six months, uh, you're probably only detecting about 40% of the people who truly were infected six months prior. And so those data from the end of 2021 uh, really don't reflect very well anybody who was infected prior to, to June or so of 2021. And most of the people who were infected in the fall and winter wave of 2020, 2021, and certainly in the spring wave of 2020, probably don't have antibodies that are detectable anymore. And so the, the reality is those numbers were much, much higher. And you know, I would estimate that in kids, that, uh, that level of, uh, of true infection prior was well above 75% to 80%. So even going into Omicron, the number of uh, people, you know, certainly kids and young adults in the US who had not been infected or were not vaccinated was a very small proportion. So that wall of immunity was already built before Omicron came. But again, let's look back at the impact of Omicron. We had a huge wave of deaths associated with that epidemic wave. Again, the second most that we had seen and, and only uh, vaccine I think was responsible for reducing that below what we saw before. And if you compare us to these other countries, we experienced far more deaths uh, per capita, a much higher mortality rate than any of these other countries. So that number, 195,000, is the number of Americans that have died of COVID-19 since the beginning of the year, right? Just in the last six months, essentially, up to the end of June. That's a massive number. Uh, and if you compare us to these other countries that, again, had very few COVID infections, relatively speaking, prior to Omicron, and thus should have had a much smaller wall of immunity, they did much better. Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Australia, 
they did two, three, four, five times better in terms of mortality rates than we did. Now, the one outlier there, as you see, is Hong Kong. And we've discussed Hong Kong before as a special circumstance. The issue with Hong Kong was that not only did they not have any prior infections, but they had a very low rate of vaccination in their most vulnerable population over the age of 65 uh, and no boosting in that population. Also, uh, about half of the vaccines they used were the inferior Chinese and activated vaccines. So that lack of vaccine protection in Hong Kong is what explains their uh, pretty abysmal performance during the Omicron wave. But aside from Hong Kong, the two outliers there are the US and the UK, two countries that allowed you know, relatively unchecked infections over the last year. So this wall of immunity theory is just bunk. It doesn't pan out. Um, so allowing people to get infected over and over again is not giving us protection against morbidity and mortality. Again, almost 20% of the deaths we've experienced in COVID-19 have happened since the beginning of January. It's even worse when you look at kids. Uh, so look at uh, all pediatric age groups, age zero to 17. Uh, and you know, th there's a little bit of wonkiness here because the CDC kind of changed how they were counting in the middle of this period. But essentially, you know, the bookends are still uh, as accurate as the CDC data can give you. And that means that about a thousand kids had died of COVID-19 by the end of 2021. Uh, by the first week of this month in July, that number was over 1,600. Uh, a net increase of 640 cases. And I should credit, this is uh, Carter Metcher who did this data compiling here uh, and uh, looked at this trend. So if you look at that, that means that 640 out of 1,650 deaths over the, uh, over the COVID pandemic occurred in the last six months. That's 40% of all pediatric COVID deaths have occurred since the rise of Omicron and, and these other variants in the last six months. Uh, hardly mild. Uh, what does the future hold for us? Well, it looks as if new uh, variants with more immune escape and higher levels of transmissibility are already on the rise. Uh, BA 2.75 uh, has been taking over in India and has now been found in multiple European countries and the US. And now this uh, sub variant of BA 5, BA 5 2.1, also seems to be uh, much more transmissible Missable and uh, have much higher degrees of immune escape. Uh, so whatever hits us in the next couple of months, and you know if timing bears out from the most recent trends, our next new variants will probably hit the U.S. hard in September. Um, it may be these two variants. It may be new variants that we haven't seen yet. But the I think the trend is clear. We're going to see many more cases in the fall. And I think the trend is also clear that uh, we'll see lots of people saying we're OK because it's mild and uh, we'll be looking back at the smoking wreckage in the spring of 2023, wondering how this all happened. Thanks.